Hello there everyone, you've tuned in UXW Bill, and in today's video I'd like to take a moment of your time, or maybe even a little bit more than that, considering how I'm known for my rambling, and talk about some interesting little Chinese-produced electronic digital clock kits. Yes, these things are really quite neat. I just received one today, in fact. It's a little bit different than the others. We'll get into that a little bit later in the video, but for now, I want to talk about these particular kits and what ultimately led up to my having built several of them. Yes, I've been a regular clock building fiend lately. These are the three that I've put together so far. And I actually have two more coming, plus the one you saw in the bag just now, to assemble. They really are that cool. reason for buying so many is the fact that they come in different colors. You can get different display colors, although I tried to get a yellow one recently. That's the one that's operating right now, and I actually received a green one. When I asked the seller about it, they said that the yellow color had been incredibly popular and they were sold out of them. Well, I would have been perfectly happy to wait until they had stock of more of them. And speaking of waiting, I've had these, I had a couple of these on my eBay watch list for the longest time, and then another YouTuber bought one, built one, told me about it, and I thought, you know, it's just, those are just really too cool to wait any longer. I want to get one of those, I want to put it together, and so I finally did. I think I built the first one, which has uh, white digits in the display, about two months ago, relative to the upload date of this video, and then the other one, which has red characters in the display, I built it almost a month ago to the day. I'm not the world's most accomplished kit builder. I'm not the world's most proficient slinger of solder. And some people would tell you I know nothing about it because I can't even pronounce the L. But here in the United States, we don't traditionally pronounce the L in solder. <laughs> there's a there's a red-green clip that I put in one of my videos years, years, years and years ago about him, his lampooning the way that you pronounce certain words, like the L in help and the L in solder. But I digress. I'm getting way off of the subject there. As I started to say, I am not the world's most proficient kit builder or slinger of solder. It took me about an hour and a half to build each of these clocks. first one might have taken two hours, but the time really hasn't changed a whole lot because I always go out of my way to be very methodical and careful when I'm putting stuff like this together. And that brings me to my next point. Although these are a fun little kit to assemble, and they're not tremendously difficult. I mean, if you look at this, it's all through-hole stuff except for the battery holder. Come on, focus, Candy Ham, focus. Come on, get with the program. <laughs> I don't know why this thing is so reluctant to focus these days. I don't know why it has that get lost attitude, but it, it sure seems to. I, I ought to go back to making videos in standard definition, because at least my standard definition camcorders, they would focus when you told them to. But like I started to say, there's nothing about these kits that's particularly difficult. But the reason why I wouldn't recommend them for someone who's just starting out, I wouldn't recommend this as their first clock kit, has to do with the way that they're put together. As you might have guessed from the way that this particular kit has been assembled, you have to put all the components on first, and then you go back and you do the display elements. Well, the only problem with this notion, the only potential fly in the ointment here, has to do with the fact that if you make a mistake, and you probably will, especially if you are new to the art of soldering and assembling electronic kits, you have to then complicate things even further by desoldering the display elements so that you can actually get to the solder side of the board. And, of course, that's to say nothing of quality control, which seems to be at least a little hit or miss. Out of the three kits that I've built, one of them apparently had a bad trace on the circuit board. I believe it's this one right here. You'll see my absolutely fiendishly clever workaround to this, or you would if the Handycam would only freaking focus. I really don't want to say focus, you fack! <laughs> but I, I think I'm going to have to, because it's just not... Uh, not really catching the point in a timely fashion at all. It, it will? What, what the heck? In this particular clock kit, there was a defect in the printed circuit board. I know, I went back and checked my solder job. I desoldered the digit that sits over this portion of the uh, integrated circuit socket for the microprocessor, the microcontroller, I should say, and it was absolutely bomb-proof. But when I went to make a meter test of it, there was absolutely no continuity. And this, this manifested itself, if you've gone and looked up the pinout for this microcontroller, although you probably don't know what it is just yet, 
this manifested itself in a clock that when I applied power, it wouldn't work. Just absolutely wouldn't do anything. It was completely dead when I plugged it in, but I found that if I hit either one of these buttons on the side, it would spring to life for just a split second, and then it would go dead again. Looking at the schematic soon revealed why this was. Whenever you press these buttons, they connect a 5 volt carrying pin on the microcontroller to ground. And apparently there's enough of a sneak path for enough current to flow that when I was completing the circuit it would allow the microcontroller to power up for just a moment. You're absolutely right. The ground trace was connect was disconnected on the board. I don't know if there was a manufacturing error or what was going on. I tested my solder joint, I tested the pin in the socket, but when I went back to ground here on the power input connection and ground here in the chip socket, nothing. So I finally settled on the extraordinarily high technology method to solve this problem by way of a twist tie that I simply stripped the ends off of. And then as you can see, I very neatly, especially for someone like me of very moderate skill, again, why won't the candy ham focus? I don't know. See if I can get something in there that will give it a sharp edge to focus on. But you can see how I just tacked the twist tie right on to the ground side of the power input connector and worked around the problem in this particular kit. It works perfectly now, but that certainly could have mystified someone who was new to the art of these things. Because all you get in the way of instructions... I actually got instructions that were in English with mine. But all you get in the way of instructions is basically setting instructions. They tell you how to put the display elements on the board. They give you a map of where the components go. And then they show you a schematic. So if you're not deeply familiar with troubleshooting electronic circuits, or even moderately familiar, you might be lost. But you can see what I'm talking about here. How the, uh, how the two setting buttons, again, if this stupid thing would only focus, they're tied to ground right there. So when you press them, I was setting up a sneak path such that the microcontroller could actually power up and allow the clock to operate normally for just a moment or two. I've heard that some people get Chinese instructions with these, and that only serves to complicate things further than that. So again, I reiterate, probably not the best choice for a first-time kit builder or someone who is unsure of their skills. There are other clocks that you can build that are perhaps a little friendlier, to the first time kit builder. I actually have several of them here. Like I say, I've been a, a clock building machine lately. This one's not a clock, but you get... Well, yeah, this one is a clock. <laughs> There's one. As you can see, everything is visible on that circuit board, so it's very easy to work with. This one turned out to be of pretty poor quality. There's tremendous ghosting problems within the display. That is to say that uh, segments which shouldn't be illuminated at any given time actually are. But it works. It keeps time. And this display, this display socket has been another source of grief. I appreciate the thought, but were it not for the fact that there are transistors underneath it used to control the switching of the elements in the display, I probably would have just soldered it straight to the board because that socket has given me nothing but grief. And then here's a kit that I built a long time ago and I actually made a video review about. This is known as the SH-E879 clock kit. And although, although it's not the best thought out kit in the world, it is probably the easiest choice for someone who would like to build an electronic clock kit and is new to kits to assemble successfully. You might as well forget that the battery socket even exists on this kit because the, the draw from the microcontroller is just far too great and it flattens the battery in record time. Even if it doesn't flatten the battery, a 3 volt CR2032 does not supply enough voltage or current to keep the microcontroller from latching up and crashing, which is just absolutely no good at all. These, however, actually have a proper secondary timekeeper chip on them. Beats me as to whether or not it's actually genuine, but there it is, a Dallas DS1302 timekeeper with uh, a little bit of extra non-volatile memory thrown in. And some of these kits even come with the CR1220 battery that you need in order to make the memory circuit work. That one did. This one did not. I actually went to Walmart and got thoroughly scalped for a, a $6 CR1220 battery, and here's another one that didn't. And there doesn't seem to be much real rhyme or reason to it, because this one includes the battery. 
I think it has to do with how willing the seller of a particular kit is to flout regulations about sending batteries through overseas mail. I would imagine that technically sending a little lithium battery like that through the mail is probably against the rules, but that doesn't seem to stop some of these sellers from doing it. As previously mentioned, these do come with different display element colors. It was actually suggested to me that perhaps I should buy several clock kits and make them with multicolored display elements. I may actually do that. I don't know what's wrong with me that I'm building all these clocks, but I may actually do that. The color of the display is usually indicated by a dot on the packaging, but as I say, we'll come back to that later. I have noticed that although all of these kits follow the same general hardware design, they all use the same microcontroller, they all have almost identical board layouts, it seems that the software running on the microcontroller is actually a little bit different between all of them. They behave a little bit differently in terms of how they're set. The uh, electronic piezoelectric beeper on them is driven differently, so I'm guessing it's programmed differently. And there, there are other little differences, little nuances in each one as well. And I find that kind of interesting that all these kits come from anonymous Chinese factories somewhere. No doubt there are dozens of little factories producing these. And yet they're all making basically the same thing except on the software front. Now, nobody to my knowledge has been able to actually get a copy of the software that is used in these clocks although people have asked and been turned down. I haven't personally tried it myself. I may ask the seller of the most recent clock I bought, this one right here, if they would actually send me the source code for the microcontroller. Or even the compiled code. I could probably still go through it in some way. But even if I can't get the code, there are people online, I'm aware of at least two projects, where people have written alternative open-sourced firmware for these clocks, adding features to them like the ability to choose 12 and 24 hour time because by default they're 24 hour only, the ability to select the temperature display as Celsius or as we would prefer here in the United States, Fahrenheit, it'd be nice. I haven't actually reflashed any of the code on my clocks but this most recent unit that I bought which set itself apart from the others by not including a case as well, I did go ahead and populate the programming header on the just so I might have an experiment with that a little bit later on. So it's very interesting how they have the hardware design so much in common, and yet the software design isn't. And I, and I have to wonder, does that maybe have something to do with the government structure in China? You know, China is a communist country, obviously, and one of the key tenets of communism, although I am nobody's idea of a scholar when it comes to varying types of government, is the fact that everything is held in a, in a communal sort of way. Wealth is supposed to be distributed, ownership of businesses, property, things like that. I don't know how deep it runs because, like I say, I haven't studied it, but I wonder if that accounts for the hardware similarities here because it seems to me that establishing rights over intellectual property is something that the Chinese don't particularly like to respect to start with. I mean, look at all the counterfeit semiconductors out there but also wonder if that has to do with the government. And I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm very legitimately curious, and maybe we can expand upon that in the video comments area. So, let's see. What else is there to say about these things? If you're going to buy one of these and build it, what you will probably get is a power cable that attaches to your computer's USB port. And it's here that you want to be very, very careful in how you decide to power one of these up if you want to operate it as a standby clock. I think the best thing that you could do would be to get yourself a high quality line voltage to USB port style power adapter from a reputable manufacturer and use that to plug in the power cable that came with your clock. That's the safest thing you can do as the microcontroller in these runs directly off the power input. There's no voltage regulation in place like there is with this SH-E879 clock that I talked about earlier. And if you use something, let me see if I can find one here. I don't know that I have a, a linear power supply in hand with a line frequency transformer in it, but if you use something like that, the problem you can run into is the fact that most linear line, tra line frequency transformer based power supplies, which you can usually tell because they're heavy, you know, line, line frequency transformers are almost always heavy, they got a lot of weight to them. Um, 
the, they tend to be unregulated, and when they're lightly loaded, their output voltage goes quite high and can result in you burning out the microcontroller instantly on your clock kit. And what a terrible thing to have happen. Unfortunately, I know someone who that did happen to after they put all that work into the kit. What a bummer. I'm almost there, almost to the point of putting the display elements on, which means we're going to want to look very carefully over the work I've done here, make sure that it's right, because in a moment the component solder sign is going to be all covered up. I don't see any mistakes on this, having gone over it a couple of times now, but those of you who are watching the video and have the advantage of a pause button are probably getting ready to say, you idiot, there's a cold solder joint on there. All right, so assembly again continues apace. I'll go ahead and turn the background music off just again so, well, you know. As you can see, I've put all the components on the board. I'm greatly curious about the purpose of this LED. It's, it's inscrutable. I have no idea what it does. But the little speaker's hooked up, and that little speaker is just so darn cute. I could almost eat the thing. So let's, uh, <laughs> let's recap here. I went ahead... And I did something a little above and beyond what the kit normally calls for. You can see those four header pins there. I don't know what the right way of cutting a multiple width block of those down to size happens to be, but I'll tell you this. It's not using a side cutters, and it's not using a coping saw. In fact, in the words of the truly inimitable Red Green, the saw was coping a whole heck of a lot better than I was. But persistence pays off, and I did finally get through it. So if I ever decide that I want to reflash the microcontroller on this clock board, it's got the provisions to do it now. I'm just so proud of the job I did soldering that speaker in. It looks, it looks so nice. And it didn't come with the leads attached to it. And of course now the Handycam is just doing a bang-up job of focusing. But I let it sit here with the power on, just running down the battery for about the past half an hour or thereabouts while I worked on this. And... Who knows, maybe the warmth has loosened up the gears in the focusing mechanism. Maybe that's the entirety of the problem. But we're just about to the point where the rubber meets the road now. Look at all my solder dots. Some of them are much better than others. But there are a few on here that I'm quite proud of. I'm quite proud of how that battery holder went into place. Take a look at those. And I'm also pretty proud of... what else? How I put the LED into place on there. That's actually a surface-mounted part. And while it took about 800 hands to do it, same thing is true of those little speaker leads. They just, they look just about perfect in all their high definition glory. So I'm really, I'm really looking forward to getting this put together. All I have to do is put the integrated circuits in. They're sitting back there, and then attach the display elements and see how wrong this can go. And for anyone who was wondering. Although this multimeter has been working well, I think I was right to be suspicious of it because I actually tested this surface mount diode to determine its polarity before I put it on the board because it wasn't marked in any obvious way. I mean, normally there's like a beveled end on an LED to indicate which end is which, but both sides of it were beveled, and when I did the diode test on this meter, it said it was open in both directions, and I doubt very much that's true. So I went over here and got the terabad meter out and did some testing that way. And it ended up being able to illuminate the diode, so I'm not real sure what was going on there. I think when I bought this little gray colored multimeter that it's still running on the battery it came with. And who knows how good that battery even is. Probably not very good, but we'll do the same test that I did earlier. Put this thing in its diode testing mode, and we'll just kind of we'll kind of poke at the display until something glows. Haven't found it yet. Wouldn't it be funny if if two multimeters did not have enough voltage and current delivering capability to get this thing to light up? There, there we go. I saw it. Okay, it really is. It really is a green display, and from the looks of it, it's pretty bright green. I mean. You know that multimeter cannot be putting out a tremendous amount of current to forward bias the LEDs inside that display element. So it will be interesting to see how bright it is when the uh, clock circuitry is actually driving it instead. Of course the clock uses a pulse width modulation approach so as to control the brightness. It uses a slightly higher, higher rate 
And then at night, when it's dark out and you're supposed to be sleeping or whatnot, and I probably can't get this one to do it because I've got this light on over here. May not be able to do it. There we go. As you can see, it dims. It dims almost to invisibility. So it just changes the uh, pulse width modulation rate that the microcontroller uses. But let me go ahead and put the display elements on here and the get the ICs all socketed and we'll be ready for the moment you've all been waiting for and I'm pretty seriously stoked about this. Alright folks, without too much further ado, it is time to test this bad boy out and see if it actually works. I'm absolutely dying to power this thing up, see if it actually does work. I'm still watching that live stream that I was watching when I started building this thing and we've been kind of talking about that in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> we look over here. You can see. I wonder. I wonder exactly what language it's going to speak. I'm hoping for English, but I'm thinking. You know, what if it does end up speaking Chinese, as I mentioned earlier? And you know, worse than that, what if uh, what if some ornery Chinese man somewhere or woman or whoever decided instead of making it talk about minutes and days and things, it'll say naughty words in Chinese. And as you can definitely see. <laughs> I was not the only one that was thinking that way. So let's zoom that out. That was surprisingly fluid camera work. Of course, I'll make up for it later by pounding on the microphone or something. Okay. I guess we ought to start with the little, the little backup battery. See if I can actually get that open. This one uses a different battery holder than the others do. We'll plug that in and see if something starts glowing red hot on the board. Certainly hope it doesn't. Oh, look at that. Can you leave these little soldering scribbles all over the place? These little cut-off component leads. And of course they stick to the speaker. And this is about to result in the use of some potentially unprofessional language right here. I think I got them all off there. I don't think there's any clinging to the circuit board. Make sure that speaker's not shorted to the circuit board. And what will we do to test this? We'll plug it right into the computer, so when something's wrong, like a dead short on the board, we'll get to find out just how much current a USB port can actually source. Well, that was interesting. <laughs> I have no idea what it tried to say there. Sounds like it's a girl. Of course, it might have just been invalid contents of the registers in the chips. There's a reset procedure on, the, on these that you're supposed to follow. You're supposed to hold the two buttons on the side in. Maybe this one doesn't require that. Hmm, seems we have a bit of a problem in the display segments. Maybe I've got a, a dead solder joint there, and I have no colons in this in this either. That's two of them now. Yeah, there's there's definitely some issues here. I need to reset it. It's not quite initialized correctly. You can usually tell because it displays garbage. So maybe I'll have to read the instructions and actually figure out... Oh, that's right, the instructions are in Chinese. That's not going to do me any good. So I'll play around with it for a little bit here. I need some time to think about this, obviously, and we'll see what I figure out. So, do you remember that part where I said in the video check over all your work, make sure everything's ready for prime time. Well, I made a real big rookie mistake. And I'm sure some of you have beaten me to this point in the video about it in the comments, saying that I didn't solder in half of the Dallas Timekeeper chip socket. And it became fairly obvious when I started going over the thing looking to see what I might have done wrong. I really thought that perhaps some of the uh, some of the microcontroller pins might have gotten folded over because sometimes when you insert a large dual inline package integrated circuit such as this one it's easy to have a pin or two that gets folded over and, and that can really just gum up the works like no other. But as I was gently levering this chip out of its socket with a bladed screwdriver I noticed that the socket where the Dallas Timekeeper chip is contained 
tilt it off to the side just like that. It just tilt it over and I, and I just I just did an instant face palm. I just you know how that feeling of terror slowly gels over you. I mean it wasn't anything like that bad. But the problem is once you've put the display elements on this this thing's not easy to service. So I went and I got my higher powered soldering iron and while I absolutely hate using this stuff, I've never had all that good of luck with it. I don't know where my desoldering pump is and my desoldering iron, I've had bad luck with those too. They work well but they just don't seem to live very long before the heating element in them burns out and I haven't replaced it yet. Which might be a little bit difficult to do because I don't know if you can just buy those online from some anonymous happy Chinese seller. The ones I've always had were from Radio Shack. Anyway, the disaster's been averted. This thing's working just fine now. You can see the green display is actually quite bright. I wasn't planning on using this darkening film that goes over it, but I, I, may, I may do that anyway, because as I was handling this thing, a few of the display elements got a little bunged up. I couldn't get the top ones to desolder properly, but I got the bottom ones to desolder okay, and then I was just able to tilt it back just enough, almost like opening a car hood just to complete the solder joints on that. And now I think that the non-volatile memory should be working because the battery's in place. Well, yeah, it, it remembered its time. So the story of the clock kit is almost ready to draw to a close, but there is one more thing to do. And this, this is usually the part that's given me a little bit of trouble. I've managed to get it done, as, as you can see back here. This case is particularly non-obvious to put together. I've done three of them now, and I'm not any closer to feeling proficient about it. Man, oh man, I know, I know we've all been there, but wow, I, I do feel kind of like a dumb bunny right now. Because that was such an obvious thing, it, it should have stuck out like a sore thumb, and it just, it just absolutely didn't. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to put the cabinet together. I'm not sure what you do to hold the speaker in place. I don't know if you're supposed to use some kind of adhesive on it. I could probably super glue it on there, but I don't want to do anything that would make marks on this case. You see, that's the problem. When you take this protective paper off, the case is crystal clear. I've not been able to do this without tearing it either, but it doesn't, doesn't really matter, although the speaker holes may be a real booger to get them all cleaned up. Maybe not. Maybe not so bad. Maybe if I play my cards right here... Oh, I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> If it isn't one thing, it's another. But with some perseverance, I think I can get these cleaned up okay. Although this is just some sort of plexiglass, which is the trademark, I don't know, acrylic, that's the general, that's the generic term for it. Although this is just some kind of acrylic, it does seem remarkably resistant to scratches, which is a good thing, because when these clocks get a few miles on them, they're going to have a few scratches and things. But we'll see if I can get this, get this to come off of here. I shouldn't be boring you with this on video because this video is already on course to be over 40 minutes long by a rough estimate and I'm usually low so it'll probably be an hour long epic on something that really wasn't worth 15 minutes worth of discussion or 5 minutes worth of discussion even. But we'll just see if I can get this off of here. Although you can, you can see by this point what it is. It's just crystal clear plastic is all. And the trick to assembling it, you'd probably like to see me do this on camera so you could learn all kinds of new words, but you're not going to. You just have to figure out how to get the pieces to go together in the proper way. And then you have to insert the nut and then drive the uh, screw through there. And you're, you're home free. It, it takes a few tries. It's taken me a few tries, but I would think if you could drive a car... And given the way some people drive today, that benchmark's really not very high. I would think that if you could drive a car, you could probably put one of these together. So I'll get that together, and I'll figure out what I'm going to do about the speaker, because I don't know how you're supposed to mount that. I did find an English version of the instructions, so maybe I'll see if they have anything to say about that. Alright, my camcorder battery's about to die because I've left it powered on throughout the entirety of this little project or very close to, but let's go ahead and wrap this thing up. It's about time anyway. Speaking of time, it's keeping time very well, and here it is, all cased up and ready to go. Cannot project since the battery is low. It's impossible to project in camera mode anyway. Shouldn't you be worried more about focusing? Ace. 
anyway, getting back to this exciting subject here with a minute of battery life left. Here's what the clock sounds like when it talks. And at first I wondered if maybe it was just saying the same thing over and over again, but there are actually subtle differences in what it says as the minutes change. So it definitely is announcing the time, but I'm practically certain that it's doing so in Chinese. Well, I'm practically certain it's not doing so in English. I would assume it's Chinese because the clock is obviously of Chinese origin. And it sounds like it might actually be saying something about Beijing. Perhaps the this is what the time is in Beijing or something like that. Because if we listen to Google Translate say Beijing, it sounds very similar to what the clock says. Beijing. Beijing. I've also noticed that when you plug it in, after it's been unplugged for a little while, sometimes you get a brief burst of nonsense from the speaker. I don't know what the sound chip on this thing actually stores. I would have thought it was a vocal synthesizer, to be perfectly honest. I wonder if in a way it's not, if it doesn't have like phoneme data in it or something, and the microcontroller simply strings together the phonemes that it wants from the memory in the voice chip and produce va valid speech in that way. I'm not phrasing that very well. The final thing that I want to talk about before the battery on the camcorder finally does pack it in and give it up is power supplies. I talked earlier about what kind of power supply not to use, but I didn't say much about what kind of a power supply you should use other than you could get some sort of high quality USB power supply. But if you just want a simple wall wart with a barrel connector on the end, something like this would do a very good job. Again, assuming the camcorder is actually willing to focus on it. So we'll try not giving it a choice, but it doesn't seem to actually be working. This is a 5 volt center positive regulated power supply from an old D-Link wireless router of some kind or another. And it is the perfect thing to use for this. Plug it in over here. We'll get the multimeter out. We'll watch the Handycam's battery fail while I'm trying to talk about this. We'll turn this on. We'll stick one lead in here. We'll stick the other lead in there, and this is the thing that's key, and you can perform this test on any power supply that you happen to come across. You'll notice the voltage is a little bit high unloaded. In fact, it's a little bit higher than I would like to see, but it's not massively higher. It should be well within the microcontroller's safe operating area and avoid blowing it up, especially when it actually begins to have some meaningful load on it, because the multimeter is essentially no load at all. You'll also want to make sure that the polarity is correct. Every one of these I've built so far has been wired center positive, and there's usually a legend on every power adapter that tells you how the polarity is arranged. So make sure you have it correct if you're going to do that. In fact, we'll disconnect the USB cable, and we'll plug in that power supply, and as you can see, it works fine. So thank you for watching if you stuck it out this far. Unfortunately, I don't have a prize for you, but it is certainly appreciated, and as always, I certainly look forward to hearing your constructive commentary. Somebody just tweeted in the hour. I think that was the bare green one in the back, because I still haven't turned the hourly chime off. But as I said, thank you for watching, and certainly do feel free to leave a comment if you happen to have one. Video bonus time! I realized when I was making this, I forgot to mention two things I was very interested in talking about. First of all, if there's anybody out there who watches my videos and happens to speak Chinese in any capacity, I would be greatly appreciative if you might consider offering a translation of what the clock says, because I would be exceptionally curious to know. I also realized that I forgot to talk about the purpose of the LED on the back. It serves as a very bright form of nightlight and you turn it on by simply holding down the speech button for a couple of seconds. I think that would probably almost instantaneously destroy your night vision, but at least it's not pointing right straight at you when you turn it on. And as for how I mounted the speaker, well, it's a bit of a delicate ballet, but as always, I'm not above cheating a little bit. I actually stuck some double-sided tape on it and the microcontroller, and that served very well to allow me to get it into position. It did splay the case out a little bit, but it's nothing that torquing down these three screws couldn't compensate for. So again, thank you as always for watching. Now, 
and please leave a comment if you have one. Good night, Irene. Good night, Irene. I'll see you in my dreams.